a welcome and it's a pleasure to have uh, Mari Martiskanen with us, who's a senior research fellow at the Sussex Energy Group and the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. She's also the, is it the equity lead, the equity and justice lead at the Center for Research into Energy Demand Solutions, the, the UK yes. Trends. Yeah, and, that's correct. Uh, yeah, and then today you're talking about uh, an article that was published recently in Global Environmental Change and uh, somebody who's also been involved in this, I just wanted to say that it was an absolute pleasure both working on the theme, but also with Mari and uh, under her leadership on this. So I'm really looking forward to hearing you. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, Sid, for the introduction, and you know, thanks for inviting me to talk. And um, it's it's great to do this today. Um, so um, I look forward to it. So let me just share my screen, so then we can get the um, and um, and please do ask now that there's you know only a few of us. Do ask questions as we go along. Um, so basically, um, I think it then makes it a bit more interactive as well. Um, right, let me just see. Um, does that work? Yep, that should work. Yeah. Yep. So yes. So so basically, today's um, presentation. So this is um, about um, like Sid already said. So we did a research project. Um, it, in fact, last year now it feels like a long time ago, and in a weird way, short time ago because 2020 has been such a weird year. Um, but basically, we did a research project looking at climate strikers in. Um, six different cities and four different countries. And um, we now have the paper published from that. So um, so all of it is really based on, on, um, on sort of field work that we did in, in these particular locations. And um, we are really happy to have the paper now out in Global Environmental Change, like um, Sid mentioned. And if anyone wants to have any copies of it, we're, we're willing to share and you know just let get, get in touch either with, with Sid or myself. So so the paper is out and there was a big team of us working on it. So myself and um, Stephen Axon, who's in the US, and then Benjamin Sovakol, who's a colleague of mine at Sussex, and Sid obviously. And then we also had Dylan, um, who's another colleague at Sussex, but at the time was actually doing his PhD at Imperial College in London. And then Kaylee as well, who's Stephen's wife, helped us also. So this is a really sort of bottom up grassroots type project because it all started um, from a kind of Twitter exchange back in January, 2019. Um, and Stephen works in the US and he basically tagged me as one of his academic heroes and which I thought was really lovely and really nice of him to do. And um, so I got in touch with him and I said, look, you know, your profile looks really great. We have really similar research interests that would you want, want to have a quick chat? Um, so, and we both had really, you know, a lot of interest in the climate um, strikes taking place, particularly with the youth climate strikes that Greta started and um, we knew that there was going to be a global strike coming up so we thought it would be you know fantastic to do something about it and um, and then we managed to get Benjamin and Sid and Dylan and Kaylee all to help so this was uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on this because sometimes research projects just kind of come out out of like you know something that is not linked to a massive project grant or anything like this it's literally just a, almost like a coincidence that we kind of you know, um, connected online. So, um, so what we did is we basically, um, so we went into six different cities on the climate strike that was in September, September 2019. And um, it was 20th of September in most locations, but then we had um, Canada in Montreal, Mon Mon Montreal in Canada, we had on the 27th, so that was September. So that was kind of like a week later. Um, so I did interviews in Brighton and then um, Dylan and Benjamin in London and Sid was in Stavanger. And then we had Kaylee and Steven in the US in New Haven and New York. And they actually were there when Greta was talking in New York. So I think for Steven, it was particularly nice to be in that in that moment. Um, so we had six structured interview questions and this was really focused um, because we were interviewing people in the middle of a strike. 
So we wanted to be very clear about what we ask them. And we had very quite, you know, short questionnaire in, in that sense, because we didn't want to take too much of their time in, um, in, in the middle of protesting. So we asked people about their motivations to, to take action on, 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 on the strike day, why they were there. We asked their knowledge about climate change, whether they knew anything about it or whether it was completely new. Um, we also asked people how they felt about climate change. And that particularly I found quite interesting in a way I, I wanted to see what people, you know, how do they actually feel about it? Um, um, and we also asked people if they have them if they have undertaken any lifestyle changes so um anything that you might have considered as you know i've changed my behavior because of climate change um we also wanted to see whether people had taken part in climate action before or whether they were totally new to that um and we also asked them that you know are you intending to take any further action and what are you planning to do after the strike so and we also really asked people about their banners and because a lot of the people that we interviewed had banners and we asked what their message was on, on that banner um, and if they didn't have a banner we asked people that you know what would be your kind of message if you wanted to put it out there so that was kind of the sort of research design and the kind of data collection that we did um, and then we analyzed our data based on a sort of conceptual framework from previous literature on climate and environmental activism and engagement um, and we also wanted to kind of have um, a bit more of a framing rather than to say, okay, well, this is what we kind of came up with. So we used um, this sort of particular framework that looks at sort of cognitive, affective and behavioral aspects when it comes to climate action. So, um, so cognitive being people's knowledge and understanding and then affective be being their sort of interests and concerns and actions um sorry sorry emotions and then behavioral is lastly about actions and responses and what they've done in terms of um their sort of climate action and um we also wanted to reflect this on what sort of values people have so we also looked at some literature on values and um seeing kind of you know whether any of this kind of action and what people say why they are doing things whether that actually has any reflection on um on particular values so altruistic values were about helping other people biospheric were about helping the earth and egoistic was really about making oneself better off and we also found those even though you you know you think that this is all about climate and it's all all, all for the good of um of the planet and also hedonic about you know enhancing your own happiness really and um and then we coded all our data and we looked at um the sort of um you know different data in terms of our interview question topic and what sort of codes we find under each each of that so that was um i won't go into more detail in that because that's all in the paper but basically it was um it was quite a rigorous rigorous process because there were quite a you know there were six of us doing the um coding in effect and checking things so um i think that was a really nice way of doing it um and then um, I wanted to kind of like, um, I'm not going to go through all the results that we had um, from the from the um, research interviews, because, you know, there's a lot of we have a lot of tables in the paper, for example, and um, um, but one of the things that I really wanted to touch on is that um, it was um, so when I talked about emotions before and we basically with emotions, we just basically identified um, what emotions people sort of mentioned about when we asked them about, you know, how do you feel about climate change? So then we looked at, well, what what is that emotion that people are talking about? Um, and then class them, you know, according to different um, different emotions. And um, so I've, I've given you some examples of that. So, for example, we had about 23 um, instances of people talking about fear, and this was really prominent, and people really had a lot of cli climate fear, and fear for the future, and fear for their families and the planet, so that came up, they came up really, really strongly. But also equally, there was a lot of hope. So people were very hopeful about um, particularly the action that they were doing. And I think this is probably some of the things that um, shows kind of our resili resilience, I suppose, as a species in a way that, you know, there is fear. We know that we are doing a lot of bad things to the planet, but then at the same time, people are being very hopeful about it. Um, a lot of people felt very disempowered and kind of let down by governments and, um, you know, whether people, um, whether actually anyone is actually really seriously taking any action. And I think that's a really sort of common issue that we see, for example, in media when it comes to reporting about climate change. So anyone who's been following this, we get the same narrative over and over again that, you know, 
this is really urgent and this is important and this is causing a lot of issues and a lot of problems everywhere. Um, people like Greta get a lot of coverage, but then still at the same time, the governments just say, oh, but we have a target by 2050. And it's like, well, no, that's too late. It's happening now. So, so a lot of people did feel quite disempowered um, in that sense. Um, and um, just to give you a couple of other ones, so that you know, there was a lot of climate anxiety. So that's quite common, and that's um, that's again something that I think previous um, researchers have also touched on and found. You know, there's a lot of a lot of anxiety about climate change because it's really it's quite unknown, isn't it? And that's the things that often gives you anxiety. So not like now with the COVID situation, we don't know how long it'll be going on. Same thing with climate change. There's a lot of sort of uncertainty around it. So people were obviously concerned and they also had a lot of anger. So we did hear from people saying that, you know, they, they were actually really angry and really mad about all of this. So, um, and often say that, you know, government is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, so this is kind of like, you know, to give you a kind of just a range of sort of, for example, just on one theme um, that what, what kind of results we came up with. So um, particularly on the emotions, you know, we had a lot of different ranging um, emotions all the way from fear, all the way to being hopeful. So really kind of across of the of the different um, emotions that people can have really. Um, so, and in the paper, there's more about in terms of then looking at things like, you know, motivations and all of, um, all of that. So every single um, research question that we had or interview questions that we had we then had results for all of those and um, like I said I, I won't go into a lot of detail in um, in this presentation for all of them but in the paper we go through all of them in, in a lot more detail um, but I wanted to just to give you an overview also about um, you know what people actually talked about when when we asked them about motivations in particular because I think this is quite key um, for thinking about something like you know someone taking a day off work potentially or their study or just taking a day off to go and do a global strike. Um, so we need to kind of, you know, find out why people actually want to do it. What is it that is motivating them? Um, and just to let you know that this was actually one of the, probably one of the biggest global strikes that have ever taken place in the world. Um, so it was, you know, um, millions of people taking, taking part. Um, so really a big, big thing. Um, and also a lot of employers and a lot of companies and organizations were actually encouraging people to do this and take time off. Um, you might argue that, you know, it's just a greenwash that they said to people to do this, but um, they were very supportive. A lot of people were very supportive um, in terms of um, having their employees to take time off employees to take time off. So um, so again, people had very ranging motivations in terms of why they were taking part in the strike. So um, most of the time, people obviously mentioned that, you know, they were really concerned for the planet. Um, um, a lot of people said that they wanted to influence public opinion and they wanted to influence also government and um, policymakers and decision makers um, opinions. Um, a lot of people said that they wanted to look after future generations. Um, so we had a really mix of people that we interviewed um, and we basically just tried to get as, as varied mix of people as we could. And a lot of people were actually what we, who we interviewed did have families and they said that, you know, they are doing this for their children and their children's um, generation. Um, we didn't actually interview any children in this um, research because that would have been sort of um, a bit more complicated for research ethics reasons. So um, so we really only focused on people that were over 18, but a lot of people mentioned their kids as the kind of motivating factor. And a lot of people were there out there in the strike also with their children. So, um, and for many people, it was really important to be part of a movement. Um, and I mentioned that earlier that, um, you know, for, for a lot of people, um, taking climate action actually gives them a lot of hope. So being part of that movement was really empowering for a lot of people. And they really, really said that, you know, that's a really important thing. Um, a lot of people did it for solidarity, particularly mentioning countries um, that are really badly hit by climate change. Um, some people mentioned, for example, the small islands that are being, you know, are going to be underwater soon because of climate change. So solidarity for other people in other locations was really strong as well, which is great. Um, a few people mentioned anti-capitalism and also security. So, um, so those was so, so the motivations again were very, very, very wide ranging. And obviously, you know, concern for the planet was the main one, but a lot of other things did come up. Um, 
And one other thing that what we found out was that um, this kind of strike as a kind of space and um, activity and um, sort of movement um, and one day that takes place um, was also um, a really great opportunity for other sort of um, political and social interests to be um, to be highlighted. So, for example, um, in in a lot of the strike places in all of the cities actually maybe not so much maybe in Stavanger because the strike in Stavanger was quite small um, but uh, particularly in London where it was quite large and again in the paper there's the details of you know roughly how how many people took part in each of the locations um, so there were a lot of political organizations involved a lot of other organizations that basically you know lobby for other um, maybe social justice issues or other political issues were also taking part so so people went there because it's a climate strike, but actually they came with other issues as well um, to promote. So, um, so that's quite interesting also in the sense that under the umbrella of climate action, you also have these other, um, other sort of um, issues that people feel very strongly about, but they also feel that these are issues that they can bring into this space. So that was also quite interesting for us as, um, as researchers, I think. Um, and in, in terms of the values, so we, we identified, you know, the kind of different values linking to people's action. And um, I mentioned already that, um, you know, there were a lot of people striking on behalf of their children. And, um, and then the biospheric one is obvious in terms of, you know, acting and doing some, something in, um, in terms of, you know, helping the planet and uh, looking after wildlife and not really talking about humans as such, but actually talking about the planet. Um, we also did see quite egoistic values, so particularly some young adults were striking, almost kind of, you know, they were saying that they are preserving their own future, but at the same time they were seeing the strike as a kind of more of an opportunism, uh, opportunity also to kind of improve, I suppose, their own uh, future position to some respect that you know people were heard to be saying that well this is going to be really great for my Twitter follow-up for example or I can make myself really visible on, on, online for my followers where I'm here so um, so it is of course you know it's a marketing opportunity for some people as well um, and then um, you know there were also very kind of head of hedonic values that we identified so for example one man was really doing this just to impress their girlfriend and they were hoping to get maybe a little bit intimate after the strike so that was quite quite interesting also um so um and just to sort of um so basically what we then um did in um when we had looked at all of our data and all of the sort of reasons why people take action and what type of action they take um and what kind of lifestyle changes they've made and i'll touch on that a little bit later on um so we basically then um, came up with a typology of the different types of climate protesters and um, so bear in mind this is only based on 64 interviews which is um, you know it's it's still it's a good number of people but then at the same time if you have a typology like this you would ideally test it with a big, bigger data set and with a bigger sort of even even more like a survey data but um, but I'll tell you what we found out so we basically found um, seven different types of sort of protesters and I would love some other future research um, you know to test this and see whether this actually is true in a, in a larger data set like I said so um, so we had we had really those kind of frontline protesters so people that are really focused um, and they really are the people that are in extension rebellion and they will take and um, take time off and they will go and basically go on strike for a long time and they will take action and they will protest um, in um, in a very sort of, you know, civil disobedient way. So really the kind of frontline protesters, um, so, so that was the one type. Um, then we had those responsible protesters who were very, who were very dedicated at making um, lifestyle changes. So for example, I spoke to one uh, young family who, um, who were thinking about, you know, how they could basically um, reduce their flying. For example, they they had decided that they were they were only going to do one flight a year. They had got rid of their car, and they were also thinking about how they could potentially maybe move somewhere else and, and live some a bit more sustainably. And they were saying that they were doing it because of their child, and they had a young, very young child. So, um, so they were really sort of they came across as very sort of you know dedicated and actually. Think you know they can change the whole life on this um then we had these sort of latent protesters who were previously inactive um or maybe even you know quite unsure about whether they're going to do about their climate action but they were still 
there on the day. Um, we had these sort of what we call disengaged protesters. So they were only there really for, for somebody else. So it's along those lines, that, oh, I just came along because my mom did it or because my friend did it and I just followed somebody else to come here. Um, so that, that kind of protester I think is quite interesting because you know they add to the numbers, but actually are they sort of what kind of action will they take later on? I think it would be really interesting to find out whether it's just for them kind of, you know, another kind of, you know, I've done that and that's it. I can tick that box. Um, and now I can go and have lunch with my <laughs> friend or something like that. Um, and we saw these sort of opportunistic protesters. So this was basically about, um, you know, capturing other social benefits. Um, so for example, I mentioned before the, you know, the getting sort of social media um, exposure, for example, or um, getting sort of some sort of fame and becoming famous in the climate movement. So, um, so that was one of one of the kind of protesters that we identified. Um, and then also these parallel protesters, um, you know, showing solidarity with others or valid validating their professional expertise, for example. Um, so, and, and then lastly, it was really these kind of skeptical protesters who still, you know, they came to take part. They, they maybe were saying that, well, they know something about climate change, but they're not necessarily feeling that passionate about it. And they really just, wanted to come and enjoy it on the day. So um, so we came up with this typology from the, based on our data and it would be really great just to see that, you know, whether this, um, you know, what, with a bigger data set and in different countries as well to see, you know, what this would actually look like. And I think in terms of, um, I think one of the things with typologies always is that, um, you know, we, we kind of here, we have put people into certain sort of um, categories, but I think when I look at this, there's probably over, between the different different types of protesters and I think also it could be that you know sometimes somebody might be in a more active role and then other times in a less active role so I think that also people's um, sort of um, protester type might change over time as well um, so for example you know you never know one of the families that I mentioned before it could be that maybe a few years ago they would have been one of those sort of more sort of latent or disengaged protesters but then they, after they've had a child that's actually tipped them over to become more responsible in a way so it would be really really nice to do further research on this and to see what what how this sort of uh, play out um, with the bigger data sets as well. And um, so I just wanted to summarize the findings. Um, and um, so, um, and I think one of the sort of, really the sort of main things that we kind of took home partly, and Sid, you can also add to this, because this is kind of my view of the of the research. I, I want to hear also what you have to say afterwards. So, um, so people really, um, you know, they take part in strikes in order to help the planet and help themselves. Um, to help other people and then help future generations, which is, um, you know, obviously this is very, you know, this is quite obvious that, you know, why people go and do it, uh, but they feel very strongly about it. Um, in terms of knowledge about climate change, um, we had um, people who knew a lot about climate change and a lot of those people tended to have background maybe in sort of, you know, environmental or energy field and um, they were quite knowledgeable about it. And a lot of people mentioned that they knew about it through work. Um, but we also had a lot of people who didn't really know that much about climate change. And that's kind of quite interesting also because climate change has is not new and it's been in the news for a very long time. So still it seems like a lot of people don't really know about it. And I wonder why that is, whether it's that you know, people just don't want to read about it. And I'm sure there's been other research that have, you know, has looked into this, but uh, we didn't really have the space in our paper to look into this, but I think it would be really fascinating to do more research with climate strikers in particular, and just think of, you know, see where their knowledge comes from and, you know, wh why is it that some people still don't really know that much about it? Um, I mean, it's a big topic and it's complicated and there's a lot of, um, you know, complicated science involved as well. And it doesn't help that there's still a lot of climate denialism that gets a lot of media coverage as well. So um, even though the whole, you know, all scientists agree that, you know, this is happening. We still have a massive lobby, mainly probably from the fossil fuel industry saying that actually, you know, it's not as bad. So, um, so in that sense, I think it's quite interesting that the knowledge is actually not as high that what we maybe even expected before we started doing the, doing the research. Um, 
And I think the fear was really, um, I don't know how it was for you, Sid, but I really definitely felt the fear when I was doing the interviews and the anxiety and people really felt almost um, at times they felt quite hopeless, but then also they had a lot of hope, which is kind of nice. So, um, and this is something actually that we didn't, in the data, we didn't really look at in great detail, whether it was the same people saying fear and hope, but um, the numbers kind of match in that sense. So, um, but I think it's, um, again, I think it's um, that sort of fear and anxiety and anger um, is, is very prominent. And I'm wondering, I mean, now, obviously, you know, if you think that in 2019, people had a lot of climate anxiety, and now in 2020, they have a lot of COVID anxiety. So I'm wondering about, you know, what does this mean as a whole for, for people kind of like, you know, going forward, and we have a lot of these really big issues that we have to deal with at the moment. And climate change is not going the way, unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine for that. So um, there's issues, you know, there's steps that we can do and there's things that we can, we can, um, you know, do in terms of technologies and renewables and all that sort of stuff. But I think at the moment it's looking like that all of us just have to do a lot of adaptation. So I think the anxiety might also come from the fact that people will really have to change their lifestyles quite considerably in the future. Um, so, um, and but I think, so, you, you know, there was a lot of fear and I felt a lot of fear when I was talking to people, um, not me being fearful myself, but I, you know, they were really passionately talking about it. Um, but also that empowerment was really strong. So I think people really, um, they really felt at, that, you know, going out on the strike and being there with other people, um, you know, is amazing. And um, it's something that actually gives them gives them hope in a way so now obviously you know we are in a situation where we can't um, as easily take part in protests even though protests have been going around on during the covid as well but i think it probably has to stop some people going out and protesting on on some issues so um so that empowerment i think people taking action together i think is really important and i think that's something that policy probably is failing at, to recognize at the moment um and um, I already touched on a little bit on the lifestyle changes. So again, like I mentioned before, we had a whole range of emotions in terms of how people felt about climate change. And we also had a whole range of different lifestyle changes that people had taken, but mainly mostly people mentioned eating less meat. And I think that was really a good finding. And that's also, you know, there's been a trend now for quite a few years, you know, for a more, lot more plant-based diets, for example. People mentioned about flying less. That was one of the other things. And I think it's, um, it, I think it would be really interesting to do this research in a totally different cultural, cultural context, for example, because I, you know, we did this study in, um, in basically, um, you know, developed countries that um, or in the global global north. Sorry, I'm, I'm, if I'm not using politically correct terms, um, but basically the countries that pollute the most mainly. Um, also, so I think it would be really interesting to see. I mean, so people in in those countries often can give something up you know they can give up give up meat and they can give up flying because they are doing that already quite a lot so i think these sort of lifestyle changes when we are talking about i think this is really important to consider you know looking at the context where are we talking about because a lot of people might be in a situation where they can't actually do these things in the first place and they won't be able to give these things up um but obviously you know eating less meat and flying less will have a lot of impact on your emissions. So that was really great to hear that, you know, people actually have taken steps for, um, for doing, um, doing actual changes. Um, and a lot of people mentioned recycling and buying less and doing voluntary work or working less um, or doing sustainable consumption. Um, and as an energy researcher myself, I've actually found it quite interesting that not many people actually mention things like doing energy efficiency at home or doing renewable energy at home. I somehow would have expected that to be, you know, maybe mentioned a little bit more, but it wasn't mentioned as much as um, as the other two, for example. And maybe it's because it's actually easier to do things like, well, I'm not going to buy that burger next week and I'm not going to, you know, book that flight uh, or, I'll, or the next holiday that I go to. Um, so I think those are kind of quite easy things maybe for people in some, some respect also to give up. Um, so, um, and, um, and what also I think what was really nice about um, when we looked at the kind of, you know, when we asked people whether they had taken part in climate action before and about a, a half of people, half of the people said that they, they had protested before and then 
about a half the people said that you know it was their first time taking part um and um and that was really great because it was it's not, climate action is not just a hippie movement anymore you know people from all walks of life um are taking part um so and people you know it's attracting new people to to come along into this domain as well um i mean yeah yeah there were some people that said that you know i've been doing this for 12 years and i've been doing this for a very long time and still you know we need need action but there were also a lot of new people coming and young people coming and basically just you know um, getting involved, which is really great for the movement itself, really. Um, so, um, so, and I thought at the end I'll just give you um, just a couple of reflections on the on the research. I'm wondering how I'm doing for time. Um, am I doing okay for time still? Is it? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, great. Um, so, um, so I basically I mentioned this already a bit. Um, at the beginning and um and i've been since doing this having done this research i've spoken to a couple of um other researchers working in, in this field that were not part of the paper and um and it's actually quite difficult to get, get funding for this type of research for some reason funders might not necessarily be very kind of keen to fund um you know research on climate action so um and we didn't we certainly didn't have a you know funding this was really we did this on our sort of spare time and uh or part of our kind of other research um, activity that we are contracted to do. So, um, so we really, we were really lucky that um, I was working with people like Sid, who just feel really passionate about research and just say, yes, I'll happily go and do this and uh, give my time. So that was that was really great. Um, um, but it does make me also question about the way kind of research funding structures work. But that's a whole a whole other sort of <laughs> you know topic for conversations that we could have, um, and. Um, and the kind of type of interview that we did was a mobile interview. So I I have not used this kind of a tool myself before because I'm used to interviewing people so that we are sitting down or over the phone or in a cafe or in somebody's office or, or somebody's home. So actually like walking and talking within a busy strike was quite, um, I don't know how it was for you, Sid, because you, you have had kind of a couple of events where you did your... Um, interviews, but um, and you did some of them over the phone, but it was definitely something to think about. If anyone is thinking about doing this kind of research, um, you know, you you are ac actually out on the field, and you have to also be mindful about how much time you you ask from people to, you know, they are there to protest, um, and they are moving and they are walking. So, for example, next time I will make sure that I take a clipboard because the, it was very windy in Brighton, and I had all these consent forms that people had to sign, and uh, so there was kind of like you know some of that going on in that um, as well. Um, and like I said um, before, that I was really lucky to have the people help with um, with this project and give their time. But I did have questions myself that you know, shall I be actually striking on this day? Uh, rather than working. Um, so that was one of the questions that I kind of had myself. Um, I also had a couple of um, sort of potential participants who didn't want to take part in the research after they saw that I worked um, at the, or I'm situated in a business school and they were really sort of they said look I'm, I don't want to take part in this research because business is the reason why climate is, is um, if climate change is happening and I tried to tell them that look all my research is on grassroots stuff I'm not a business person really but they were very kind of like you know clear that no it's a business school I'm not interested which again was quite interesting in a way that you know some people um, you know if you think about that if we are going to get um, you know climate change solved um, should protesters climate protesters be ready to speak to all parties, should we actually have this kind of more collaborative approach where we bring everyone together? Um, is it helpful if, for example, myself, <laughs> I'm very anti-Amazon. Is it really helpful if I, if I, if we think that well, actually, there's no point for us to talk to business because they're not going to do anything about it anyway? So I thought that was quite, from my kind of personal point of view, I, I found it quite interesting to sort of reflect on a little bit on these sort of issues um, and just kind of think that we you know where am I situated myself as a researcher who feels very passionate about climate change, um, you know, doing this kind of work. Um, so on a day when everyone else is striking, um, but um, but I, I I think it's worth that we I, I think it was really worth that we did it. So um, and I really want to thank my team for helping it with it as well. So um, and um, so we did the. We did the, and just very lastly, we did the research. I'm sorry to bring COVID into this, but you kind of, nowadays we're all living in, in the middle of it, aren't we? So we did this in 2019 when 
and um, nothing like COVID. We didn't even know anything about it. And now the whole idea of being amongst thousands of people, um, interviewing them with, in, a, in, a, in a group just seems so weird. Like, you know, how much things have changed just in, in, in over a year. Um, but I think it's fascinating in a way that, you know, people have been talking about climate change as an emergency for a very long time. We now have a really real emergency nothing you know um comparison to the kind of emergency that we've had before in in our lifestyle lifetimes i suppose um in terms of with this pandemic but at the same time we've known that climate change is a massive emergency and it's um it just makes me kind of question that you know why are we not taking the same kind of action we know that climate change is damaging and we know that it's going to have devastating and also really badly um you know, bad economic effects all, um, across the world. And um, it's already having a lot of impacts. Um, a lot of people are being displaced and suffering because of climate change. Um, so that's why I'm wondering about, you know, what a climate lockdown would look like and why is it that, you know, we are not really doing as much action on it um, as we should really do. And, and particularly as somebody who's worked in this space for quite a long time, I always think, and I wonder like, governments always give, give these targets that are very, very far reaching, you know, like I mentioned before in the UK now we have a, you know, target for a net zero society by 2050. And I'm thinking that by 2050, we might not have Antarctic left anymore. So it's very sort of, um, you know, obviously politicians like to say take long targets because then somebody else is going to be responsible for them in the years to come. So um, but just a few reflections, I think, um, in terms of, you um, you know, um, on, on this year. And I think also COVID is probably having an impact on the movement itself, because there's less opportunity for people to get together because of the social distancing rules and um, the lockdowns that we've seen all, all around the um, all around the world um, in, in different countries. And I think it'll be really interesting to see which way our behavior goes after lockdown, for example, or after we get out of the pandemic. So for example, in the UK, a lot of people had already said that, you know, they had given up their car. But since COVID, we have had quite a lot of, um, you know, um, opinion polls showing that actually people are now going back to their cars and doing, doing less public transport. So I think the implications from the kind of post COVID world, once we get to that one day, hopefully, um, so that might actually, you know, it might ch change also how people are behaving and what, what we need to think about. And it might change the way, way climate action is um, approaching this because um, there might be a big change. Um, so um, but, uh, I'll leave it at that. And thank you for listening. And it'll be really great to um, you know discuss with both of you and if you've got any questions. Um, so thanks for that. Um, Shall I still share my screen? Can I, shall I stop that now? I think or? you can stop it. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Thank you so much. That was a really, uh, really comprehensive talk and uh, really enjoyed following it. And I, I think it's fair to uh, um, pick up on a couple of the points that you brought up since you, you did um, sort of ask me where, where I was in regard to thinking about it. Maybe I can put it into speaker view. Um, so, so I'll say just, I think you covered all the things I'd like to say, but I could highlight a couple um, that that really I kind of resonated with. And one was around commensurability, this idea. I've also noticed uh, um, you tweeting about uh, retrofitting uh, a house and how there are certain kinds of climate action that require a different kind of bar, like a more structural fix than, than reducing meat consumption or it's sort of one day of the week or um, things like that, deciding to organize holidays in a different way. Um, but, you know, if we were to organize different things in society, like when everybody takes holidays so that there's less pressure on flying at certain times versus sort of a smaller number of flights over time, those kinds of things. I wonder if, if climate action doesn't actually help as much to push for certain kinds of structural change. But on the other hand, as you mentioned, it opens up sort of space for um, for bigger pushes. So I, I, was, I was really taken by when we entered into the social movement literature in writing this paper. And I did think that one of the things uh, that was a bit surprising to me was how limited 
the work on the what I'd call the emotive geographies of climate protesters itself. Um, so I, I thought that just when Benjamin mentioned to me that Mari was doing this paper, I was like, that's such a fantastic idea. And then later when working on it, I thought it's it, it's surprising that there aren't more people who've been looking at this. And I think partly it is because of the things you mentioned. It's the way funding works, but also what kind of field work is involved. You have to really time it. And and I think one of the things that we flagged in the paper, which I hope also stays um, something that gets built on, is that we do this in different kinds of contexts. So I, I, that was one of the things that I really echoed with as well. And then finally, I, I think just to bring up a couple of things from the field work um, when I was doing it in Stavanga, where you know there's a much smaller uh, protest, but the advantage was you also got to talk to almost sort of half the people there, that there was a huge range, even in that small group of things that motivate people, but also um, sort of, what what they feel the point of it is it was really different one had come with a paddle boat and was deeply disappointed by another who wanted to move into the sort of oil and gas part of the energy sector and change it from the inside and they disagreed sort of on the premise of whether this is something that is part of trying to work on climate change so just having those spaces to open up those conversations i thought um was was another of the things that struck me about this field work. So that's a very long um, comment rather than a question to you, but uh, but <laughs> I, I do have several questions. I just wanna check if Melissa wants to uh, go first since I've been talking a while. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. I mean, wow, what an exclusive seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining. <laughs> uh, and I, I have to say, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your um, reflections and your yeah your presentation uh, coming from I would say uh, one of the old timers <laughs> one of the hippies <laughs> who has been very active in the demonstration field <laughs> um, but no longer is for different reasons um, First of all, you know, your, your um, labeling of, of um, demonstrators, um, I, I, I realized that I have been moving between those levels, uh, which was interesting. And at the same time, um, been involved in not just demonstrations, but uh, groundwork in the green <laughs> um, field, put it that way. Um, I've, I've worked for an NGO who was concerned with consumer, um, green consumerism. And it's quite interesting to see that we also had some of the similar experiences as, as you had, uh, as you all had during your survey fieldwork, um, some of it reflected in the skepticism to where you're coming from, um, what kind of um, survey you might be actually doing, um, not knowing this, this kind of skepticism, which is a little bit some of the reasons why I stopped doing it. Um, for my own part and oh. and in a way I, I, I felt that's quite that, interesting yeah because what I see is that um, over these years that I've been active the, the polarization has gotten so extreme and it's quite daunting to go out and demonstrate not so much in Stavango where I live which is a small space and, and fairly safe but I have been also involved in other demonstrations where it's not been so safe. So uh, this is one of my concerns is, is uh, what's happening in the global demonstration uh, arena and, and why it's happening and, and uh, how can we still have a voice as concerned citizens um, in 
in a democracy, so called, um, and and still try and move the movement <laughs> in a good direction. And that's that's great. Um, thank you so much. It's, I'm I'm really pleased to hear that you are in Stavanger. I actually came there um, a couple of years ago on a different project. We did like a focus group on electric vehicles and I went to the oil museum with my colleague and it was one of the best museums I've ever been and also I was thinking like well how is it like what is it like for people who live in Norway do they have like massive climate guilt because basically you know they have pumped a lot of the oil that well a lot of us have used over the years as well but I think I think it's really fascinating what you were saying about um about the the sort of the movement um I mean I used to work for um uh, before I became a researcher, I worked for the British Wind Energy Association. And we did some work with Greenpeace, for example. And um, and it's funny because we were an industry association promoting wind energy in the UK, but it came across almost like, um, you know, the people in Greenpeace were thinking that we were not radical enough because we were not may maybe doing things um, in the same way that they are doing things. And, um, and I think it's, um, I think, it's really interesting in a way what you were saying about that also that there's so many you know different voices and thinking about you know how, how you do it and what I find fascinating about it in a way is that it seems like a lot of the climate denialists are very united but the climate activity movement is not necessarily in the same way united mm -hmm. um, and I also do think that you know um, I wonder actually I don't have an answer to this but I wonder whether local action versus global action is better in these things sometimes. I mean, obviously now we are in a globalized world and all societies are linked through, you know, big global corporations and stuff like that. Um, so, but I do think in a way that, um, you know, whether, you know, obviously, and I've done, I've, I've done a lot of research on local level things like community action on energy and um, helping people who live in fuel poverty at the local level. And I do think sometimes that, um, you know, there is a sort of, I don't know how those two can best be sort of connected because it's, you know, it's very easy just to go to a global climate strike on one day and think, you know, I'm taking part in this, but then keeping some really kind of focused localized action going for a long time is actually really hard and it takes a lot of effort and you need a lot of volunteer time to do it. Um, so, and, you know, personal, um, issues will, will come, become involved, there's different people involved and people will have different opinions of how to do things. So um, so I, I do think in that sense, um, I think it's a fascinating movement in a sense that, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, every, everyone can take part to some extent, you know, I mean, one of the things that we did discuss in the paper and I didn't really say in the presentation yet um, is that there is still, I think, some accessibility issues because not everyone, for example, will be able to afford to take a day of work to go and strike. Um, and not everyone might be able to do that um, for mobility reasons, for example. Um, so, um, so I do think that, um, you know, there is a sort of issues of, you know, who can actually access this kind of action and um, how to do it effectively in a way. So, um, but it's great to hear that you are in Stavanger and that you have, um, you know, done, did you actually go on the, on the day of the strike? Did you take action yourself? I'm afraid not, but I take okay. action every single day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, that's another thing. I'm, I'm not so, um, I'm, you know, the, the, the COVID and, and that now recently is a reason why I'm, I'm not uh, physically actively out there. But, but there's been a, a number of reasons over the past years. And uh, um, there's... Th yeah, these events and the feeling of empowerment that you do get, which I've also enjoyed so much previously, um, is an important, um, it's an important thing, a feeling that needs to be um, brought up more in, in, in everything that we do and, and to feel um, that we can all contribute different phases in our lives we do different things <laughs> and and have an idea that we're we're all part of the movement even if uh, we're not visible out there anymore I, and and regarding your your questions towards the end uh, how will 
these demonstrations look in a post-COVID world um, or a post-climate um, emergency uh, world. Um, I'm hoping we won't get there, <laughs> but, but uh, it's, it's interesting how we're getting along with digital platforms. Um, you know, six months ago, I wouldn't even dare to sit and discuss this with you on a screen. <laughs> so, so much is changing so quickly. Um, but uh, yeah. Can I pick up on that? Um, Please. <laughs> I don't know how it'll change. I guess we have a bit of uh, a bit of a snippet now from the past month. So a few months ago, going out to Krekastol and close by to Pulpit Rock, I bumped into Greta Thunberg, who was uh, there taking a walk uh, with her dad. And uh, it was a Friday, and I thought later you know, looked up that she'd uh, tweeted a photo from there with the background, and uh, and that you know that is also a way of protest that you take it digital. It doesn't have the same emotional impact and so on as being somewhere and sharing that solidarity sense. But it does, um, in a sense, it gives you pause for yourself as well, right? It, just being out out without people. And then, and then I was part of something that was in the UK the past few months, and this book came out of it called Siren Poets. Um, uh, what if we can't save the earth, but if the earth could save us? And it's by Liv Tork, who's a fantastic uh, poet and performance poet. But she curated this as one of the four siren poets, sort of young national UK poets for this year, as something where instead of doing it alone, she drew in something like 60 people, did small workshops with them. And I heard of it through Mikhail Nachmani, who's uh, also doing such fantastic work in the climate space. And, and she gave a few challenges, asking people to, you know, um, take a walk in nature, be naked in a garden, be by a stream, talk to somebody much older or younger and have these relations, sort of these experiences and then reflect. And so we wrote a collaborative poem out of that on the premise, I spoke to the earth and the earth said to me, mm -hmm. channeling that experience. Yeah. And I think that those kinds of modes and watching sort of the, the online book launch where people who'd contributed poems read out it was a shared experience, which again, I agree that it would have been really hard to do that months ago with, you know, diverse group of people. Mm -hmm. So those observations, I, I have a question for you, Marie, and that is, you, you know, you, I think you've been fantastically productive and you've made a real contribution in research and, and around sort of this issue, but also looking at decarbonization, looking at it at, you know, these quite applied scales. And, and I wonder, um, two things to you, what is, in a sense, your own work illustrates what you think is worth doing because then you're doing it and that's fantastic. But what is it that we can do from, from the space of academia, right, with the tools we have? What is it that we can do more of that we could perhaps have incentivized differently that would help us to make more of an impact? So what are the things you find frustrating or limiting um, and that continue to drive you? And then the second part, so no, no small questions here. The second part is, um, you know, in the article, it sort of, and you've said in your talk that it would be nice to see this sort of work happening in other places in the global South, if you like. But and the kind of challenges that have come up just in our discussion of whether people feel safe or whether, for instance, you might feel that a government might threaten you. Um, what are the kinds of things, maybe COVID gives us also some insight, where there are real threats that that we could have all of this shut down and that there's been that big debate on doom, climate doomism, you know, um, should we, when the, the New Yorker uh, piece came out, New York Magazine piece on uh, the uninhabitable earth, there was a lot of back and forth on whether we need things that inspire or whether it's okay to, to talk about climate change in a way that brings up fear. So do you, do you have a, a take on that? I think actually what your two questions actually linked really nicely, because I think partly we as academics can ask those difficult questions. We can do that because oftentimes our fund funders will hopefully oftentimes, definitely not, I mean, my funders definitely don't tell me what to do. <laughs> so, you know, I have certain certain things that I've committed to, but I think I think in that sense, researchers have a, you know, we are the people who often ask the hard and difficult questions. And I think, you know, that's our role also is to ask those questions and see, you know, where the gaps are. Um, I think in terms of academia, um, 
I think one of the things, obviously, you know, the publishing process and getting stuff out sometimes is quite long. So, you know, like with this one, we did the, we collected the data in, um, in 2019 and then it was published in 2020 so it took pretty much a year from from the date when we started collecting data and then when we had the article published and that to me seems actually quite a long process uh, sorry quite quick in a way like from data collection to paper being out um so that was quite quick one in one year but sometimes it can take a lot, a lot of time um and i think with academia as well it's like you know, we can set out and think, okay, we have a brilliant idea and we want to do this and um, execute it. And then people might think, well, actually, you know, we're not interested. We just want to go and have a look at the latest TikTok video. So I think somehow, you know, we need to also um, figure out and how, how we can actually get our message out there. And I think for that reason, people like Greta are great because, you know, she is saying that listen to the scientists and listen to the science. And I think that's a really good message that she's putting out there. Um, so, um, but I kind of like, um, the, I think there are like different types of academics. Um, I personally tend to like go for research projects that I find interesting. Sometimes I do projects because I have to like, you know, make sure that my time is funded. Um, but I think just asking interesting questions and asking the hard questions, um, is going to be, you know, something that we, we should really keep doing. And I, I, I really appreciate that, um, even though you know we have Brexit in the UK now and we have a questionable government to some extent, um, you know we are lucky. Probably same for you. You know we are lucky to be in a country where we are allowed to ask those questions and we are allowed to do this kind of research. So I really feel for the colleagues who are in other contexts who might not be able to do that, and also the protesters. So you know a lot of environmental protesters have been killed because of the actions that they've taken. So, um, so in that sense, I think also, you know, it's it's kind of easy for for me from my home in Brighton to say that okay, you know, this is great, let's all do this. But I think it'll be a very different if I was, you know, um, pro protesting um, against logging of um, rain rainforests, for example, in Brazil somewhere where there's um, quite horrible action against activists taking place for that's just one example and it's everywhere in the world so um but i think that's why we need to ask those hard questions and be willing to do the work um and then hopefully you know um i'm sorry if i don't have a definite answer on that but um but yeah i think that's all we can do as researchers for now and then hope that you know message will get there and things like you know digital media and um social media i think they work for our favor as well we can definitely get our message out there for a much wider audience than if it was just academic papers, you know, um, like it used to be maybe 20 years ago. And occasionally you might get your story into, into a newspaper article, whereas now we can tweet about it and we can get it out there to people um, and we can share it by email. And so I think the digital tools work in our favor as well. Um, though you have to be careful with that though, because a couple of, maybe about a month ago, I was at the receiving end of a very um, um, strong um, nuclear lobby, even just only for sharing an article that colleagues had written about renewables and um, nuclear. So all of a sudden people who never have followed any of my tweets or any of my uh, um, uh, other sort of, um, you know, messages there um, started um, questioning my integrity because I was sharing an article that was actually published in a, in a reputable journal. So there's also a lot of fake, fake um, sort of information um, about research and people trying to undermine research. And I think in that sense, we just have to be very clear. Uh, sort of own research practices that the work that we are doing is actually really solid and it's um, rigorous and it's based on on good methods as well so that when people try to you know um, say that it's not then we can say well actually it's going through a peer review process so sorry that was quite a rambling question so um uh, so. Well, we're, <laughs> we're on the R as well and it's been it's been really productive I think conversation and uh, it, it's been nice to listen to you also just to um, to revisit I think things once they're out they take on a life of their own and they're still doing work in ways and uh, and it also be nice to have this uh, talk up.
Mm. Yeah, and I've actually really enjoyed the small scale seminar because sometimes you just see lots of people, small people on the screen. So it's been really nice to actually, you know, have a proper conversation with Maylis as well and uh, hear from from your kind of, you know, uh, because if it would have been a bigger group of people, we might have not had as much time for discussion in a way. So. And thank you. And probably if it was a bigger group of people, I wouldn't have dared share so much. <laughs> That's the other, the, the other side of the coin. Um, but oh, thank you so much. This was very inspiring. And uh, as Siddha, you, you said in um, introductorily that most of my group are busy with the exams. So am I. Um, and I've been um, taking this time to, to, yeah, to tune in to what is the core message I need to get through to my <laughs> senses. Um, and it's been very inspiring. Thank you very much. That's good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining and for sharing your own experience as well. And thanks, Sid, for organizing. It's been really nice to catch up. Yeah. Thank, and thank you, Mary, so much for taking the time. Always fun to. Good luck with everything. See ya. <laughs>